Hello, everybody. This is uh, Bishop Mary Gray Reeves uh, speaking to you from Sargent House in Salinas on June 22nd, 2016. And uh, I am speaking with our presiding Bishop Michael Curry, who is in his office in New York City at uh, 815 Second Avenue. Is this correct? This is where you are at yep. the moment. Okay, excellent. <laughs> and um, Michael is gracious enough. It's all right for me. I should call you presiding Bishop Curry. I apologize. Yeah, it doesn't. Or Mikey, maybe we could get Mikey, away. yeah, I agree with the bad morning. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can tell we're friends. Yes. Um, we're working very much together. Um, I have the honor of being one of the vice presidents of the House of Bishops. And, uh, Which I am very grateful. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Likewise, and it's a, a blessed relationship and um, certainly one that I'm grateful to have and grateful to serve in this capacity. And uh, taking full advantage of my position as one of the vice presidents of the House, I asked Michael if he would please uh, spend a little time with us on um, uh, just this video call to talk about the Jesus Movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael, just to fill you in on uh, where this request came from, we did a little listening tour in our diocese uh, with some of our folks, about 50 of our people, to just ask them, uh, what do you love about the Episcopal Church? Uh, what do you want to see happen in our diocese? What do you think our biggest needs are? And what are our greatest gifts that we can offer into the community? And they were fairly kind of predictable questions, I would say. But in the middle of those questions, uh, our team asked, what do you think about Bishop Curry's uh, putting out there that we need to be a Jesus movement in the Episcopal Church? And um, I, I, I thought, wow, we really found a button and we pushed it because we got a lot of really great reactivity of people great. kind of nervous about the language and, mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't know about that Jesus word and you know, I've, we're you know we're quite uncomfortable about just using the name of Jesus, which I, I think is is a, an interesting thing about us as a tradition and something that's fairly revealing in some ways and, mm -hmm. and good for us to explore. Um, even the idea of movement, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a movement, and how is that? How does that work with an institution which is so, you know, polar opposite to the to the sentiment of the word movement? So. So I thought, well, I will just, we'll just ask Bishop Curry himself what he thinks about this language of the Jesus movement. So, um, so I'd love to just hear you go, just go crazy on that for a few minutes, and um, then I, I can take it from there. Well, thank you. Uh, really, thank you, Bishop Mary, and thank you uh, to all the folk who responded with good, thoughtful, um, good, thoughtful, critical questions about what are we really, what are we really talking about? Because I think that's right on. I think I really do. Um, you know, there are a couple of strands that come together for me. Um, um, the, the truth is, I'm a child of the civil rights movement, which is to say, I'm a child of people who were active participants in the civil rights movement. And so I grew up in a home where the language of the movement um, was just, it was a given. Um, now, my father was an Episcopal priest. Um, he's no longer living, but he was an Episcopal priest until the day he died. And um, his priesthood um, was exercised not only in classic ecclesiastical and liturgical ways. I mean, he was a Beretta well wearing Anglo-Catholic priest. Um, you know, I mean, in a historically black congregation, you know, and you know, we did the smells and the bells and all that. I grew up on that and that. And, and yet the processions didn't end at the door of the church. They actually went out into the streets. Um, and so I, the image of movement is a part of my personal psyche. Um, but broadening that, um, the, the language of Jesus movement for me has, has kind of two streams. Um, one is, actually comes from the world of biblical scholarship that um, when um, New Testament scholars and patristic, those who look at the early church, um, one of the ways that they describe the earliest of Christian origins is they refer to the Jesus movement. That is before it became church in the formal, in the more formalized sense in which we under, begin to understand it, even before the Constantinian settlement. Um, you'll notice that New Testament scholars often refer to the Jesus movement. And actually the first time I remember having heard that phrase um, was Elizabeth um, uh, Fiorenza, I can never say her name properly, um, um, in memory of her, in her book. And she talks about the Jesus movement 
um, and how the Jesus movement was a profound and real challenge to the status quo of the Greco-Roman and Jewish world of its day, because it was a movement that included people who were often excluded mm -hmm. um, from the institutional structures of the society around it. So that was sort of, I, I don't remember when she wrote that book, I'm guessing it was in the mid or early 90s probably, um, but that triggered it for me. And since then I've seen um, a number of scholars who use the phrase, the Jesus movement to refer to the earliest days of the Christian movement, if you will, because it was a movement before it became institution. Um, wow. And so that's the second, or that's one strain, but the other strain is a little bit more contemporary. Um, um, Clarence Jordan, or Jordan if you're in the South, uh, Clarence Jordan and, and Cornelia Farms, um, he kind of coined the phrase, um, he used the phrase the God movement, and then later in some of his writings began to talk about the Jesus movement. Again, he was writing in the 40s, 50s, and um, early 60s until, it, until he died. Um, but uh, Jordan was um, um, a passionate Christian who um, was also um, an agricultural scientist um, who was passionate about ending poverty. And so he went to, uh, I think, University of Georgia, this is in the 30s, um, to study agricultural technology so he could work with farmers on improving their crops as a way of, of engaging hunger um, and eradicating rural poverty. Um, he was committed to that, and, but he wasn't committed to doing that from a secular perspective. He was committed to doing that because he really did believe that this was how he followed the way of Jesus. Um, and, and so that was coming out of his Christian commitment. Uh, he eventually, with several others, um, and his wife and some other uh, couples, uh, created a Christian, an intentional Christian community in the early 40s. And their intention was to, to create a community that was both grounded in, um, deeply grounded in the life, the teachings, and the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's, I think that, that's an important, that, that Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus that we see in the New Testament, um, to be even more specific, that for life to be wrapped around his, defined by his way, um, is a radically changed life. And that's not the same as the cultural, uh, what we often hear in the culture, uh, but, but life that's really defined and shaped and formed by both the teachings of Jesus and the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. And they created um, a Christian community that continues to this day. Um, and, and that Christian community, um, and this is in the 1940s, following the teachings of Jesus, was committed to ecological sustainability and stewardship. This is long before anybody else was even talking about that. But they were in rural Georgia. They knew the value of the land, and they read all those parables about wheat and tares, about mustard seed. Um, that, that his eye is on the sparrow. I mean, they, they read all that stuff, um, as well as Genesis. They got the creation story and they realized that saving this environment is saving life. That's God's work. So they were committed to that. They were committed to racial and all forms of human equality. This is in the 1940s. This is before Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. This is Martin Luther King was still in college when they were doing this. Um, they were committed to equa human equality. Um, they were uh, in, in all in their life and, and around. Um, and they came to these conclusions, not based on a sociological analysis, but based on their commitment to living the way of Jesus of Nazareth in their time. And he used the phrase initially, um, the God movement, in place of the phrase, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven because he said kingdom doesn't really mean a whole lot to people in rural Georgia, and it doesn't have any imagery, for, doesn't really come alive, but people know what a movement is, because a movement is something that changes the way the world is. And so when um, uh, Jordan, who was a New Testament scholar, he got a PhD in New Testament, eventually did the cotton patch version of the New Testament and several other paraphrases and translations, he used the phrase, the God movement, um, for the kingdom of God. So uh, in the Lord's Prayer or in the para, all the parables where Jesus said, 
the king says the kingdom of God is like, and then he tells the parable of the mustard seed or tells the parable of the good Samaritan or the parable of the sheep and the goats, the last judgment. Substitute instead of the kingdom of God, the movement of God in the world is like a mustard seed, a good Samaritan, a prodigal son coming home and being received. You know, you can go on and on. And so that is sort of the other, both the New Testament, formal New Testament scholarship referring to the original Jesus movement and, and someone like Clarence Jordan. And that community where he was, um, that he was a part of, that, that community steeped in the life and teachings of Jesus was a community that um, influenced um, one uh, couple uh, who were the founders of Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. It grew, Habitat for Humanity grew out of a community committed to living the teachings of Jesus. And I was at a conference not long ago um, in, uh, we were in Atlanta at the Carter Center. Um, and uh, it was a, a conference on um, um, creating um, a common statement by leaders of uh, Palestinian Christian churches in Jerusalem and their counterparts here in the U.S. And so I was there with, the, uh, with our Bishop um, of Jerusalem. Um, and so we were all together and came up with a common statement. Well, the last day that we were together, uh, President Jimmy, Car former President Jimmy Carter came and addressed us. And in his address, he made reference to the impact of Clarence Jordan and the Koinonia community on his life and his continued witness. That for me is where the Jesus movement comes from. And when I talk about the Episcopal Church being even more and becoming the Jesus movement in our time, I believe that that is a really compelling in image that creates a counter narrative for the popular narrative of what it is to be a Christian in our culture. Amen, that was great. And I, I actually, um, we, our colleague group uh, read The Beloved Community by Charles Marsh. And which okay, Charles Marsh talks about this. That, yeah. that whole thing, and it is such an impressive um, story. And as somebody from Florida, we, I knew the Cotton Patch Gospel, but I hadn't, yeah. I didn't remember that Habitat had grown out of that community. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing that I think that story illustrates and that Marsh ties in is that when the civil rights, some aspects of the civil rights movement, when the movement tried to get um, really institutionalized, right. um, it fell apart. It fell apart. And, That's and it right. was the local, it was the, the teaching, because he tries to outline, here's what we learned from the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. about how to work justice in the world, right? I mean, I really sense that from the book. And mm -hmm. how do you do this? You know, how do you have a movement that's effective at bringing about the kingdom of God or the God right. movement or whatever we want to call it, but creating justice in the world? And mm -hmm. the key is to keep it local um, yeah. because it grows yeah. other big things that are effective at being big. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say as a, you know, as, as a part of an institution today, it might have been that at a time the institutional life was effective at mm -hmm. spreading the good news of Christianity, but I think we're experiencing it at a time now where it isn't effective. And right. so to go back to the local way, it's not mm -hmm. either or, but right now the local way is the more effective way yes. um, of growing the local. I loved also the quote, um, well, two things. Along with that, he notes um, in the book, uh, removed from its home church, the beloved community withered and died. Yeah. Which I think is when we when we try to make it too big and shiny and showy and say, look at this great program, actually we lose it. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, we're so busy getting the job done that we forget that actually what happens when we're working on an effect, a, a task that is worthwhile and good for justice is that we're building the beloved community. Right. Uh, in the midst of that, it's both, you know. I was having a great conversation with someone this morning about, is in our board meetings, we always have a really kind of quite a long Lectio Divina session on a scripture for the day. This year, our board is studying the book of Acts um, to look at what is the, we're, we're really good at discipleship in the Episcopal church, but we're not very good at apostleship. So how can yeah. we learn more about apostleship? Well, book of Acts, that's pretty much the, that's what they do. <laughs> you know, that's the manual. Yeah. So we've been studying that. So she said, I'm going to start doing in our vestry meetings, I want to start doing Lectio for our vestry meetings. And mm -hmm. um, we talked about how the effectiveness of that is that you'll so much more easily go do the work when you are grounded in the scripture, you know. Yes. Which is, yes. uh, which is absolutely Quinnia's point as a, as a community. And just, just to our listeners out there, I highly recommend reading The Beloved Community 
Yes. Uh, by Charles Marsh. Charles it's, Marsh. It's a great book. When was it? Was it written in the 90s? Yes, he wrote it in the 90s. He was still in Baltimore. I knew him in Baltimore. <laughs> and okay. He wrote it in the, it was probably the early 90s, I think. That's He's actually a Bonhoeffer scholar. He teaches at UVA in oh, Virginia. Okay. He's a Bonhoeffer okay. scholar. But he did that, I think, in the early 90s. Um, I know he did it while he was in Baltimore and before he went to UVA. And he's an Episcopalian. He, he went to the, I used to joke, he went to the cathedral in Baltimore, but he came over to St. Jane. I said, when you need religion, just come on over to St. Jane. <laughs> come to us. We're still wearing yeah. our berettas with pom-poms on our heads. Come on That's over. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, another, another quote that he, ha he says is, um, being a revolutionary, and then it, some, he heard this in a staff meeting somewhere, but being a revolutionary meant learning how to act out of the deepest silence. And I just thought that is a, such a great quote. And I, I think um, sometimes in the Episcopal Church, we're not very good about speaking about our faith. You know, just even saying mm. the word Jesus is sometimes yeah. difficult for some of us. And sure. so, but what is in our deeper silence? You know, there is still um, a groaning of the spirit, as the Bible says, you know, that, mm. that speaks from that place. And for us to find the utterance, the ability to utter out of that deeper silence, I think is... Um, that that's a calling that the spirit has on us, I think, in the Episcopal Church right now. And I believe there's a hunger for that. Because yep. that deeper silence, remember Howard Thurman? Yeah. You know, about deep is the hunger. Um, that, 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 that deep silence taps into not only the deep hunger, uh, but the depth where God is to be found. Mm -hmm. Where, and and I, I just believe that there's a real hunger. <laughs> there's a real desire for that out here. And sometimes, you know, in the Old, in the Old Testament talks about um, idols. Yeah. Um, idols are attempts to find a substitute for the real God. Yeah. That's, and the danger of idolatry um, is that it creates new evils that are not in fact the God of love. Right. And I think we're in a time and a culture where the danger of creating new idols and new golden calves, if you will, to borrow from the Bible, is real. And, and for the Episcopal Church and other churches and other peoples of faith and goodwill to help point us to the living God, where real, the, the source of all that is truly loving, yeah. to point us to that source and not to the idols of our own making. Um, this is a major contribution to the healing of the planet. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you hope for an outcome here? What are, what's, your, what's your big goal, your objective? Where do you want us to be in five years? <laughs> oh, just off the top of my head. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, I, I, so on some levels, that question all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and on some levels, I, because of the the time in which you know, again, each time has different demands on it, and um, and and I think you are absolutely right when you talk about this is a time for movement, uh, because a movement has the capacity to be profoundly elastic, flexible. Mm -hmm. I'm avoiding the word nimble because we're overusing that, yeah, right. <laughs> but it has the capacity to keep moving um, and forward, and it's, it doesn't get stuck um, on some of the institutional realities which once served us, but may, may not serve us any longer. And if you're in the movement, and you're about the movement, if you will, of God, of Christ in this world, then you're in a position where you can let go of some things that no longer serve the movement and other things will replace them that do serve the movement. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in one of those contexts or times right now, just as the Episcopal Church, so that the more we adopt a movement posture, if you will, and which in, entails a real openness where the Holy Spirit is really leading us or maybe leading us, then we will find our way through letting go of some institutional things that do not serve us. And many times it's buildings. Mm -hmm. It's some buildings. Um, we can let them go gracefully. 
um, and find other ways to move forward. Because if the movement doing is following the movement, if we're talking about following where Jesus, the risen Christ, is going in the world now, then we can let go and take on with some ease, actually. Because it's not about preserving an institution or keeping the church the way it always was. You see what I mean? Or, yeah. or populating buildings that used to serve a previous generation that had just come out of the Second World War and they were building suburbs all over the country and they were building highways and we were building churches. Well, that was the 1950s. This is not the 1950s. <laughs> I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me that I was. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's uh it's kind of like remember there used to be a, a television commercial. I can't remember. Uh, I think it was Oldsmobile, who's no longer in business, but <laughs> you don't bother Oldsmobile anymore. Um, I mean, the the truth My is, Oldsmobile wasn't that a line? Go ahead. It was. Yeah, it was something like that. Well, you know, the church is. Um, you know, I mean, the church has responded pre in previous generations to the age in which it found itself. Uh, earlier this morning, I was doing a, a video for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and they are, and the, and the Lutheran world is commemorating, they're commemorating the 500th anniversary of, of the Protestant Reformation um, and, and the work of Martin Luther and others. That Reformation changed the landscape of Europe and, and, and the Western world. And it was the result of, not the result, but it was partially occasioned or catalyzed by Gutenberg's printing press. Mm -hmm. And the church in its time, the institutional structure in its time, resisted any movement to get the Bible in the hands of the people, in the language of the people, partially as a matter of control, but also partially because we haven't done it that way before. <laughs> I mean, you had those dynamics of an institution that was stuck in the way it was doing things and therefore not capable of moving into a new age with the same gospel, but not capable of moving into it. The Reformation was a way of saying the church must not change its message, but must change its delivery systems yeah. and its means of conveying that message. Um, and, and that was 500 years ago. Well, you know, Phyllis Tickle says in her book, I think she was quoting Bishop Mark Dyer, who said about every 500 years, uh, the church kind of has a rummage sale and has to sell a lot of stuff and reform itself and recreate itself. And she, Phyllis Tickle, in her book, The Great Emergence, goes on to say that, well, this is about 500 years, mm -hmm. and it looks like it's not Gutenberg printing press, but it's the computer chip, mm -hmm. and it's the web, and all, everything that spins out of that social media and everything else. And once again, the church must engage a reformation. Institutions don't do that. Movements do. Movements do. That's right. Movements do. Yeah. And if we as the Episcopal Church embrace that, mm -hmm. here's what I can tell you. I can't tell you exactly what it looks like, but I can tell you this. It'll be alive. Mm -hmm. It will be dynamic. It will be organic. The important thing you said was that it's movements that make the change yes. and institutions don't I, i'm fond of saying it's like institutions actually really don't care very much what you think they just want you to do your job which is to go and really proclaim the institution you know i have behind me here this bear i can't remember where i got this bear oh I, i'm sure one of my miami friends gave it to me uh -huh. we'll be it's got sunglasses but it has this um this button that says jesus was an episcopalian Oh, I love it. It's you can do one too. <laughs> you can do one too, but really, we just like, uh, they've got to shift that around somehow. I'm sure he was an Episcopalian, but, you know, he was a Christian at first. He wasn't even one of those. Actually, so yeah. Go of even some of that, those thoughts or that language is, um, yeah. I mean, this is funny, but yeah. in a way, it's, it's not funny like, because we yeah. actually think that. <laughs> I know. It, that's kind of sad, but anyway, we do. <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I think uh, one of the things we've been starting, we're talking about working on being a learning community out here mm -hmm. so that the, the organization of church here actually is learning, mm -hmm. um, which is really a movement kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So in the sense that um, no one's looking, well, they still are, but we're hoping we're going to shift the gaze, really, 
um, of us to uh, more towards Jesus, more towards what's happening in our local communities, rather than asking me as the so-called head of the organization, you know, what are we to do next? Right. So that right. the organization itself becomes smart, you know, in a sense, like a smartphone, right? So it yeah. knows what to do. Mm -hmm. And so increasing our capacity to be creative and reflective in our own context about how we share the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing that, we've been using this, this idea of spectrums. So we mm -hmm. have the spectrum of discipleship and apostleship, um, the spectrum of uh, management and of learning, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And we have several that we, that we work with. But another one could be the spectrum of institution and movement. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because if the institution itself is not um, inherently bad. It's no. not no. effective entirely all by itself. So letting those two converse with one another. And then as you say, what do we need? What do we need to get rid of? What do we need to keep? What's effective mm -hmm. for this day and age? Um, right. Another book, uh, Phyllis Tickle's book about the garage sale, I thought was or rummage sale or whatever it was, was great. There's another little book out that a lot of people read called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Oh, I don't know that one. She's, and I can't remember the author's name um, right now, Mari Kone or something. She's a Japanese woman. She actually doesn't speak English. Oh, I've heard about this, yes. Uh, it's just great. But she, she, in, the, in it, she, uh, she talks about, you know, we mm. need to think about not what we're giving away, but what are we keeping? Right. Uh, what are the things that give us joy? Mm -hmm. And it's really very effective in the process. I thought, you know, the church, every congregation needs to read this mm -hmm. um, as they, you know, have the banners from the 1970s still in the closet that are all stained. And, you know, it's like it's time to let it go, you know, or give it back. It's, it's time to finish that up. So those are things as an institution we absolutely do need to do, including the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you, how do you, um, how do you get getting back to being a movement is getting back to our original purpose and intent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's important in the sense that the longer something exists, it takes on um, jobs and tasks and functions that may be consistent with the original intent, but they've moved further away from it. And there comes a point at which those functions no longer seem to be serving the mission, whatever that was originally. And you have to go back. What was the original mission? What was the, you know, we talk in constitutional law. What was the original intent? What was actually, and movement is getting us back to the original intent, if you will, as close as we can um, and see it in the New Testament. And your Acts of the Apostles helps to do that because it's sort of like, now this is a, I'm gonna give a dated analogy, so I'm, I'm dating myself. But when the, uh, I think, I remember reading in, I think it was in the book Future Shock or something like that. I, you probably don't even remember that. You oh were in kindergarten when you came way, out. Way, uh, way back there somewhere. Yeah, I know, I know. You're making my day, I'll tell you. <laughs> I think it, it may have been in that book or another one, but I remember um, one of the questions they asked was when the railroads, we're really in trouble. I guess this is in the 60s. Yeah. Um, and this is before Amtrak came into being. But the railroads are in trouble. And, um, and, and this person who was writing said, you know, part of the problem was the railroads thought they were in the train business. And they had to realize they were in the transportation business. Right. That their original purpose was transportation, not simply trains. Trains was one vehicle. So that they might move into a variety of ways of being Trans, doing transportation. Mm -hmm. um, I probably didn't spell that out perfectly, but you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. And we in the church often find ourselves um, doing things that may have served a purpose in one time, at one time, but, but now um, they may not serve that purpose. They may not be effective. And what was our original purpose? Well, I think our original purpose was to follow the way of Jesus of Nazareth to witness to the way of Jesus of Nazareth and to share that way of Jesus of Nazareth. I think that's what you're going to find in the Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> oh, I, I think so. And to, yeah. I, I think for our context, too, to add on to that, to change the world. And to change it. Because in, yes. you know, in the biblical context, the idea was the second coming was going to happen any minute. So that right. there, the idea of social change was probably not as critical, but it's, you know, clearly Jesus taking his time. So 
we got some we got to stay busy while he until he gets here and there's plenty to do you know right. um, and so justice becomes i think also a, a key part of that of, of what it means to proclaim the kingdom you know mm -hmm. um, Very much so. but absolutely absolutely the case i i think that's um i was speaking at one of our churches last week and uh a man who's a one of our lay leaders there he said i grew up as an evangelical and he said, it's just different. We were so clear about what our outcome was meant to be. And I thought, you know, we aren't always very clear about what our outcome is meant to be. In the Episcopal See, Church. our outcome now, um, I think, our outcome, our, our outcome I'm talking about now, not what the world's, our outcome, I think, is to see a church that is really committed and people in the church committed to following where the risen Christ, the spirit of the risen Christ is actually leading us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not, I know that that's not a tangible, I mean, you know, but let me tell you something. <laughs> if it happens, <laughs> we'll see something. There'll be some tangibility to it. Yeah. Um, because what this really is, and this is back to the Anglican tradition. This is really, a, our tradition um, really is one that takes the incarnation seriously, that, that the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. It did in the person of Jesus, but continues in a sacramental sense uh, to be present among us. Um, and, and the truth is for the word for Christ to become embodied among us in the world and for us to seek to follow where we see him going, that's the Anglican way. That's what Episcopal, that's the incarnational way. Um, so what we're actually talking about is getting to the deeper roots of what it means to be an Anglican Christian, um, where incarnation, where Christ in the world for real, um, that, old, that old kind of Catholic belief that the sacraments, um, of, of the, that the bread and wine um, becoming for us in some mysterious way the, the presence of, of Christ for us in the sacramental moment that the world is a sacrament and that Christ is really present in it and we must go to find where he is um, in the broken bread of the world, um, in the sacraments of the streets. Um, that's, the, that's the passion. I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I was, um, um, you've heard me. To say this, Mary, but it was a real change for me. They haven't heard you. <laughs> oh, they haven't heard me. Oh, okay. It was this was five or six years ago, I think. Uh, I was I was still in North Carolina. I was Bishop of North Carolina, and I had gone in a coffee shop to get my coffee um, on my way to Dawson House, and um, which I did every morning. And it wasn't any, or when I was in town, it wasn't anything unusual. But I stopped there, and, and that particular day, I had a collar on. Um, there was a guy in front of me, um, and he, he turned around and we struck up a conversation. Turned out um, he was and, and is a, a, a Mennonite pastor um, who had been um, deployed by the Mennonites to come to Raleigh, downtown Raleigh, to create a congregation, um, a, a beloved community, if you will, um, on the streets of the city. Anyway, during the course of the conversation, I asked him what the Mennonites were thinking you know, when they sent him to do this and they just provided basic resources and said, go create a commun community of faith, um, do it. And he said, and this, this, was a, this was a game changer for Michael Curry. He said, the Mennonites have realized that in this cultural context in which we're being the church, this would, might not have been true in other contexts, but it is true now. The church can no longer wait for its congregation to come to it. The church must go where the congregation is. That is only a movement's going to do that. Only a movement's going to do that. Only a movement's going to do that. And then the movement will bring the institution along, mm -hmm. and the institution will find new life in a new way. Mm -hmm. It's not either or. That's right. Well, but it is the movement that moves us to. That's where that idea of spectrum, I think, is very helpful. Because we're not talking about eliminating one or the other. We're talking about a relationship between the two. Right. One, you know, I, I'll say to people, <coughs> I say to groups periodically around here, bring me a problem. You know, mm -hmm. I'm the, as the bishop, I'm the institution. So bring me a problem mm -hmm. that I have to struggle with as the institution of the church. Then right. we know we're doing our job. 
you know, yeah. if, if I don't have to struggle with what you're doing out there and you're not creating mm -hmm. conflict with the institution, then we're off our mark. Yeah. So we ought to be struggling. I, I really do believe, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I know that I'm an optimistic person, but I'll own that. Okay, I'll own that. I believe we're in the midst of one of the great moments and opportunities as the Episcopal Church. Um, I really do, Mary. I, I think um, th there's a, um, I think there are people of all ages and all stripes and types who really are hungering and desiring a relationship with God that is not coercive, but that's real, that is grounded in the kind of love that we see in Jesus Christ, that has some ancient roots, that has depth to it, gravitas to it, but is not petrified in its gravitas, that will reach out and actually cares about the world around it potentially the Episcopal Church. I think so. And we have God. the mystery. We're good at mystery. Yeah. yeah. We are. It's one of our great gifts. It yeah. really is. And part of the mystery is we don't know why we are, but we are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but we are. In, in Jewish, that's one of the lines out of Asher Lev. The first, uh -huh. the first line is, the first mystery is that there's a mystery. You know? Yes. The first mystery is that there is a mystery. And why should I spend time trying to explain a mystery? <laughs> yeah, you're wasting time. <laughs> it, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Well, I'm I'm conscious of time, and that uh, Sharon will be coming and knocking on your door in a minute. And I wonder if I could, um, if there's anything further you want to make sure we hear. Um, if there's anything further, I'll give you one more sermon. No, I no, you have no sermon. <laughs> I uh, again want to encourage because of a lot of the content of this that we've just talked about is in the book, The Beloved Community, which you shared with us it is. Um, yeah. at the House of Bishops meeting. And mm -hmm. um, that was part of your way of casting vision for us. And um, some of us have been reading that. But at the start of chapter seven, he says, uh, and I won't use all the scripture quotes, but I do want to quote Marsh. Um, and the subtitle for that chapter is Building Beloved Communities, Dispatches from the Quiet Revolution. Oh. And uh, he says, a man or woman gets a notion to love as God has loved the world. Everyday people, African American and Caucasian, Latino and Asian American, women and men, read the Gospels, and they resolve to turn their lives into parables of divine mercy. It may happen in a sudden decision to change one's life through some trick of grace or in a slow turning. There is a call that no one but the called can discern. And there is in the acceptance of first step, which changes everything. Some hear the call in mass meetings, lecture halls, hikes in the mountains, watching the evening news, or sitting at the kitchen table at midnight. The call does not promise happiness, prosperity, or that your territory will increase. It may invite the greatest complications and cannot be successfully analyzed. The call comes with no formula or guidebook, but when one accepts it, the world will never again look quite the same. Okay. Such a great, great little segment. Amen. amen. Yeah, amen. Well, my grandma did. might say hallelujah, amen to that one. Hallelujah, amen. We might stand up and clap. We might. <laughs> oh, Lord, we don't scare Episcopalians to death. Now, that is oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll calm down. That's my, okay, well, my we might enjoy it in silence. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much for your time and um, mm. for allowing us to just listen to you go off on the, on Jesus, <laughs> which is <laughs> go off a thing for me. And uh, yeah, well, you do. Mm. It's great. It's just like, let him go. Just say Jesus and he'll be off and running. It's fabulous. <laughs>